All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nathan Lockenmeyer. This is Sadia Akasha. And uh, as Jeremy just said, together we are Sitara Systems. This is actually our first CODA Summit, and we couldn't be more excited to be here. Um, just everything that this group of people stands for is near and dear to our hearts, as we found over the past two days. Um, Tony said something yesterday that really resonated with us when she said that we've come here together to imagine the future how we as a community and as individual activists can bring about change. And as you'll hear from us during this talk, that's exactly what we've been spending the past two years think about, thinking about. And we're really excited to share how we've been thinking about our work with you. So I'll tell you a little bit about Sitara Systems. Um, Sitara Systems is a design and technology studio. Just lower that. that creates interactive works in order to challenge audiences to think critically about the future. We take ideas about complex systems and break them down into easy to digest pieces. We provide opportunities to reflect on things that are important to all of us, and we create experiences that give audiences a sense of wonder and inspire them to do more. But while we're experts in technology and design, our work takes us across a variety of domains. We've created installations that focus on topics as disparate as cancer research, climate change, and linguistics. What we bring to each project is a way of thinking about the world. We try to highlight opportunities for seeing systems at play, seeing where different topics intersect, and providing opportunities for self-reflection. In this talk, we want to share with you some themes that we've spent the last two years thinking about and how we approach them. So the, fast, the past few years have shown us that we do indeed live in troubled times. We've had the COVID-19 pandemic, George Floyd protests, climate chaos, migration crises, and increasing economic inequality and insecurity. We both deep down feel that to some extent, we're responsible for creating the world that we want to live in. Our line of work means that we're creating public projects that can have a bigger impact than we could have as individuals. So it's important to us that we think deeply about our values and what we bring to each of our projects. Our previous careers involved visionary technologies such as quantum cryptography, neural prosthetics, genomics, and data science. But we've come to realize that technology doesn't solve all of the world's problems. In fact, the world doesn't need more technology. What it needs is more possibilities. And that's why we're focused on helping people imagine a diverse set of possible futures so that we can imagine new worlds that we may want to live, work, and play in. These worlds involve understanding how to have empathy for one another and how to coexist in this complex world that we live in. We need more emotional and social skills that will allow us to navigate the difficult choices that invariably lie ahead for us. The future is an abstract idea, and the present, however, is something that we can touch and feel right now. So the question we've been asking ourselves is, how can we bridge this gap to help people envision a better future? So these are some of the themes and concepts that have been inspiring our art over the past couple of years. Um, as we said, we think a lot about the future, and we think that in order to create a better future, we're going to collectively need to develop and think about some of these skills and some of these themes. So the first one we want to talk about is connecting to nature. We're so disconnected from nature these days that we often forget that the natural world is the ultimate source of pretty much everything we see in the world, from the obvious materials like wood and stone to the technological materials. Semiconductors are mined from the earth, aluminum is purified from ore, plastic is refined from fossil fuels. But even more importantly, we've forgotten that there's a lot more important gifts that nature has to give us in beauty, art, and spirituality. As some of the artists here have shown, it can be a great inspiration for us. Indigenous religions around the world see nature in reverence. They see nature as a giver and a provider, not as something that we shape and control. 
they see that we're co-inhabitors of the world that we live in, that we cannot rule it or control it because we're just one small part of it. But we've really lost that connection with nature. Rather than thinking of ourselves as a part of the complex system, we seek to curate it and control it. Most of us only see nature day to day as landscaping, not as wilderness. We see it carefully curated to fit in the gaps of the urban environments that we live in. We have very few opportunities to see unbridled nature, to see nature as it is, and to have it make us feel small and insignificant, and to remind us that it is bigger than us, not the other way around. So what we've been thinking about is, what if we use technology to bring people closer to nature? And that brings us to the first project that we wanted to talk about, In Love with the World. So this project was a um, collaboration with conceptual artist Annika Yi and the Tate Modern for the annual Hyundai Commission, which is a site-specific commission for the Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. Annika Yi uh, is a conceptual artist. We were technical collaborators with her, and her work is focused on reorienting our relationship with both nature and technology at the same time. She's interested in how we can see ourselves as a part of this interconnected world. Can we see ourselves as a part of the ecosystem that spans the microflora and fauna that live inside of our bodies, spanning to the natural world that surrounds us, and even a planetary ecosystem? Rather than seeing ourselves as at the top of a pyramid, can we see ourselves as being just one node in this interconnected web of complementary modes of intelligence and different ways of living? And from our point of view, we wanted to know if we could work with her and find a way of bringing that feeling of interacting with nature, of unbridled wilderness, into the Tate Modern. So the idea that we worked on together was, rather than bringing the space to life, could we put life inside of the space? We transformed the, ter the Tate Modern's Turbine Hall, a former power generation plant, into an aquarium of machines. We created an intelligent, interconnected ecosystem of biologically inspired machines called aerobes that, simply put, lived in the turbine hall for four months. Perhaps that sounds a little bit underwhelming, but our goal was that these machines weren't there for our entertainment. There was no show, there was no choreography, there was no narrative, there was no climax, they just existed. We turned the turbine hall into their home, and visitors were invited to spend a brief moment in their world and to be a part of how they experienced life. We, we developed a cohesive set of lifelike motivations, behaviors, and goals for these flying machines based off of a combination of artificial intelligence research and behavioral science on real-life organisms. The organisms that we took inspiration from ranged from jellyfish, mycelial networks, insects, plants, and even bacteria in our search for finding the right balance of something familiar enough to not be imposing but foreign enough to feel almost alien and to make you just a little bit uncomfortable. As you probably noted on the last page, one presentation of our machines takes after the tentacled form of jellyfish, where there's a second one that is admittedly maybe a little less noticeable that is based off of the microbial forms of jellyfish, the polyps and the planula. One of the biggest challenges in this project was that we wanted to create behaviors for these machines that felt alive in intelligence using only nonverbal communication. We wanted people to feel that there was complex social intelligence embodied in these machines and that they truly understood the world around them, that they communicated with each other, and if you paid close enough attention, they were trying to communicate with you. Our system created two distinct species with their own goals and motivations, and even simple reflexes that allowed them to respond to the environment entirely on their own. Each Arab was given its own metaphorical brain that it used to make decisions, and each one decided moment to moment what it wanted to do without any human input based entirely off of the way that we constructed its mind. So now we have an overview. We wanted to share a video to um, show them in motion because words and static imagery really can't describe just what these machines look like.
the way that we imagine our relationships with machines is always either as subservient slaves, where the machines are serving us, we think of robots, of automation, of things that perform tasks for humans, or we think of them as threatening in some way, and we have a deep discomfort and fear of, of machines and machines becoming intelligent. What we were trying to approach was making a way that these machines could coexist with humans that didn't fit into either of those two kind of areas. The aerobes are fully autonomous in their behavior, meaning that the artificial life simulation makes all the decisions once the aerobes are up in the air. There's no pilot, there's no controller, there's no one telling them what to do and when. We dug a lot into cognitive psychology here and we looked at the research that underpins a lot of artificial life simulation, which is really based on psychology as we understand it, not just human psychology, but also animal behaviors and sort of modeling the motivations amongst animals and other biological creatures. With an artificial life program, we start from motivations of the beings that we're creating. So we think about what do these machines want? What do they feel? What, do they, what would drive their behavior? And from that, we build from the bottom up a whole virtual mind for them. And so, for example, if there's a crowd of visitors that are hanging out in one space, relaxing or lying down, which often happens, they'll find that really interesting and they might come over and hover over you and do some very specific behaviors as they're you know, sort of learning about you a little bit. And they may want to share that information with each other. Annika wanted to work with someone that wasn't just technically capable, but she wanted to work with someone that could understand her creative vision and could really help bring the feeling of these machines being alive to the visitors at the Turbine Hall. One back, yeah. There we go. All right. Um, one of the major reasons that we were really excited to collaborate on this project is that it gave us an opportunity to think about experiential futures. It gave us the opportunity to create an environment where we could ask people to suspend disbelief and to show them the future as if it were the present. Rather than telling them, imagine a new world, we showed them what the world could be like. Uh, while we were making this project, we thought about a quote from Carl Sagan where he says, the visions we offer our children shape the future. It matters what those visions are. Often they become self-fulfilling prophecies. Our dreams are maps. So what are the maps that we were creating with this project? One future we wanted people to consider was one where artificial intelligence plays a very different role in our lives than it does now. So often we think of artificial intelligence as being compared to human intelligence. We think of it always using ourselves as the yardstick for what technology can do and how it can do it. It's no wonder that our biggest concern is that they're going to replace us. We've designed them that way. In our proposed future, we wanted people to think about machines differently. We wanted to think about what if machines could be companions? What if they could be coworkers? What if they could be feral and wild like animals? What are all the different ways that they could occupy different parts of our lives and different parts of the world that we live in? Another future that we wanted to consider was one where our relationship with nature is different. Can we imagine a future where we share space with nature as it is, rather than trying to shape it to fit our world? What if we, every day, could enter the world of nature and feel as if we're the ones that are foreigners, we're the ones that don't belong, and that we are for just briefly sharing this space with them. One of the things that we wanted to achieve in this was to have people forget that they were in an industrial space, a former power generation plant made of concrete and steel, and could they just think about the living creatures that lived there? Would they treat them like creatures that were made of flesh and blood? We wanted people to respond like they would if they saw an animal in the wild. Would they stay still? Would they hold their breath? Would they wait and hope that one would come closer to them? And this project is the first of what we hope is many attempts at exploring new ways that we can bring the best parts of nature and represent them in man-made environments. 
we keep thinking, can we bring a piece of the wilderness, not just an aesthetic piece, but the feeling of wilderness, to the city and to our urban environments? Thank you. Another theme that we've been thinking about over the past couple of years is gratitude and community. Specifically, um, we've been interested in working on projects that help to develop a keen sense of belonging. So why is gratitude so important? In our opinion, gratitude is an intuitive path to finding happiness in life. We live in a materialistic and transactional world, and there is always more that we can consume, more that we can exchange for fleeting experiences. Experiences, though, often turn towards entertainment because feelings of joy, ecstasy, surprise, can lead to more transactions, more to consume. But this traps us in a cycle where we continue to chase highs. When do we reflect on what we have instead of continuing to chase more? I think for many of us, the past few years created a moment in which we reflected on what we had, what we prioritized most in our lives, and what we cherished every day. Even though it was a dark time, it gave us space to reflect, and in doing so, it was transformative for all of us. What we saw in this shared experience was that gratitude has the transformational power to turn grief into hope. During the pandemic, many public institutions were closed to all but a limited number of visitors. One such institution, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, approached us during this time to perform renovations on a project that my partner Nathan had been involved with before. So 10 years ago, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute had looked at commission an installation that would allow their donors to share their dedication to cancer research. The zebrafish, a model organism for genomics and oncology research, became the focal point of the donor, donor wall, and it became a visual metaphor for how many small donations can come together to create major change. Team members from Sitara Systems, small design firm, Hypersonic, I think Bill Washbo, uh, who leads Hypersonic, might be in the crowd here somewhere. <laughs> Say hi, if you are. <laughs> and Patton Studios all collaborated to develop an interactive sculpture with 477 3D printed zebrafish. Each of these zebrafish was embedded with an LED that would backlight the donor's personal message inscribed on it. A simple touch would cause the lighting patterns to change and reveal the donor's personal message on a nearby screen. The installation was originally designed to use touch you would touch a fish and see a message of hope. Many of these messages were about finding gratitude through grief and heartache. This installation brought home to us that hope truly grows when you share it with others. Reading these messages created intense feelings of sadness, but also of hope and gratitude. So I'd like to show you a small video of some of the messages from the zebrafish display. It's very hard working on this project. It's very emotional. We cry a little bit um, pretty much each time. Um, but in 2020, Dana-Farber Institute reached out, reached out to us again, and they asked us to help them refresh the zebrafish display. 
They wanted to maintain the integrity and intention of the original installation, uh, but they wanted to update the interaction so that people with compromised immune systems could interact with the zebrafish wall without having to touch it um, as an added measure of security and safety during the pandemic. So I'd like to just show you another very short video of um, what the refresh looks like. Next slide. Yeah. So for the 2020 update, the touch sensors were replaced with near field technology, and this allowed patients with compromised immune systems to touch their donated fish safely with their own devices. This also meant that using a phone or uh, a visitor or donor could see the message on their phone as well, and they could bookmark um, that, that page if they wanted to and revisit their fish from afar. At its core, we felt that this is a community project that brings together people who have gone through difficult times, and it creates a sense of shared gratitude and belonging. Many of the messages of hope were thanking Dana Farber and their care team, and the messages also point out how grateful people were for the time that they had with their loved ones. So we wanted to really bring those messages even closer to the visitors and donors. However, thinking about our previous theme of connection in nature, it's hard to avoid that our line of work is not inherently sustainable. As Nathan mentioned, rare natural resources are mined from the earth and through incredibly energy intensive processes, they're converted from raw ore into electronics and materials that are ubiquitous in everything that we use. Energy is then consumed to literally turn abstract data into heat and light. And when we think about energy consumption, we think of the power that's consumed while something is in use as its carbon footprint. But for computers and display technology, more than half of the footprint is embodied in the manufacturing process before it's put to use. So that's something that we've been grappling with quite a bit at Sathara Systems. Um, we've been thinking about how we can reconcile our different values that, bring, that we bring to bear in our projects. And so in, the, in, in, this, in tackling this issue, we've started thinking about the full life cycle of all of the materials that we use in our projects. Um, and we've started to develop preferred vendor lists of uh, providers that actually track all of their production details and make that transparent. Um, and we've been working with our clients to create end of life plans and taking on maintenance responsibilities for existing projects so that we can ensure that there's proper recycling of all of the electronics and materials that are being used in our installations. Recently, our work with Dana-Farber has taken a new direction because of this thinking. Um, they've asked us to shift our focus on, on working with them on existing projects because as the technology has become more efficient and is less energy consumptive, um, they've actually thought about working with us to make it more sustainable. So we're actually going back through with their installations and um, renewing them so that we can actually recycle the materials, use as much as possible, and make it more, basically about a tenth of the energy that they're currently taking. And the reason we approach our project sustainably is because if we didn't, it would be like we're saying that it's not important to us, but it really is. So by continuing to make a minimal impact and to be more sustainably minded and reclaiming those materials, we're actually practicing hope for a future that we want to belong to. And being sustainable is a practice of hope and gratitude. All right, and that brings us to our third uh, theme that we've been thinking about, and I think for me, one of the most exciting ones, because this is the one that we're currently thinking and looking at. We're looking at the role of ritual and sacrifice in the art that we create. The work that we've been thinking about nature as this kind of divine influence in our lives has led us to thinking a lot about myth recently, because myth is misunderstood. 
we think of myth as fiction. We think of myth as stories that simply aren't true. We think of myth as a long time ago, as a time when gods walked the earth and a time when impossible things happened. But originally, myth was a complementary way of thinking to logic. It's a different way to think about the world. Whereas logic deals with objective facts and pragmatic affairs, it fails at dealing with our inner worlds. Logic cannot assuage sorrow. Logic cannot reconcile grief. And logic can't create hope. You see, myth is essentially an ancient form of psychology. It helps us deal with that inner world, and it helps us by invoking events which, in some sense, happened once, but in another sense, happen all of the time in our lives. It redirects our attention from the present to help us look at the past and the future, and to think about how what we're experiencing fits into that bigger picture. And it does this by embodying myth and ritual. Ritual creates moments where we're asked to slow down, we're asked to reenact myth, to think about myth, and to be reminded of what's happening. We're asked to be thoughtful about the world that we're a part of. Ritual is designed to make sure that we don't forget the lessons and the morals of the myths. That it helps as a reminder to remind us of what we value the most and to help connect us between individuals, between communities, and even between generations. But now most of us have cleaved the world into two. We really think of the world as an objective world of logic and fact, and then we have a world of myth, which only has the power to entertain us with stories of the past. But that myth is so powerful a tool for storytelling is exactly why we've become so interested in it recently. We're looking at how we can incorporate myth and ritual into the artworks that we create. Can we add elements of theater and ritual into a piece to increase its impact? If we begin an experience with a ritual, can you turn an environment into a temple? If you end an experience with ritual, can you make those moments of transformation last even longer than they would otherwise? And most importantly, we think about how can we amplify our work if these rituals are performed over and over again across communities and across the years. All this talk of transformation kind of begs the obvious question. If we could transform people, how would we want to do it? How would we transform them? And again, myth has given us the answer. Many origin stories across many cultures begin with this idea of great sacrifice. The primordial deities of the world sacrifice something of great value to them, their belongings, their loved ones, even their creator's hands, and to bring the world into creation. But what we found really interesting about all these myths, something they all have in common, is that great sacrifice doesn't create a perfect world. The world is always imperfect, it's broken. And they acknowledge that it is our role, it's our duty, even obligation, to continue to make sacrifices every day in order to repair the broken world. So this is where we connect back to what we were saying earlier. To bring about a better future, all of us are going to be asked to make sacrifices, to give up things that were once normal, or to decline things that we don't even have yet. We won't be asked to make the great sacrifices of the myths. But we'll be asked to make a number of smaller changes to our lifestyles if we want the world to change. And ritual can help us go through that transformative experience so we know how to build that muscle and build that skill. The act of sacrificing flowers, food, even money is a small gesture that we can make that over time takes away the pain of making sacrifice. And if we're asked to make a sacrifice that's more than just a ceremonial, we won't fear it. We'll be comfortable knowing that we're performing our obligations to our community. And so to tie this back to envisioning the future, um, we've historically been pretty terrible at making decisions for a better future. Um, and that's because the future is an abstract idea. It's a bit of a myth in and of itself. And in some sense, um, it's, it's difficult for us to plan for something that we can't see clearly. So in the meantime, however, the present is here and now, and that's where we exist. It's in our face, and it's impossible to ignore. 
So how can we think about sacrificing something now for an uncertain future? But we believe that herein lies the problem and the solution. So if we practice these values now in hope for a future that we want to live in, that future then becomes more and more real to us. And that in turn makes those small sacrifices easier and easier to bear. We just need to start with the projects that we're working on and think about the future more vividly to create and initiate a virtuous cycle. So this is the next theme that we're going to be exploring um, about myth and rituals. And we're still thinking about this and thinking about how to bring these ideas um, into the world with our art. But we're convinced that we want our art to be truly transformational, as I'm sure everyone here does. Um, and for that, it can't always be consoling or familiar and undemanding. Um, so we're hoping to create art that can encourage all of us to create that better world together. And I found coming here to be incredibly, incredibly inspiring, just meeting with all of you and having to have having conversations. I think we both have. And we wanted to finish with something that um, we heard Tony say yesterday that really resonated with us, which was, we came here to reconnect as a community and to learn, share, and refuel. But hopefully, we leave with a reimagined vision of the future and the role that we all play in creating that future. And I hope you all found um, all of this very inspiring as well. Thank you. Thank you for having us come. Thank you.